Hi, this is Jessica Hagman at Alden Library, and today we have a live video for you that is actually part of our research workshop series. And we have three uh, local reporters who are going to tell us about how they do research um, when they're doing reporting and kind of what it's like to be doing research and reporting in the age of uh, fake news. So I'm going to turn the camera around here so that we can introduce you to our speakers. How's it going? To introduce yourselves. How's it going, everybody? My name is Tyler Buchanan. I'm the editor of the Athens Messenger and also sister paper, Vinton County Courier. The Courier is a weekly. We come out every Wednesday, so that's today. Uh, and the Athens Messenger, obviously, a daily six days a week. And we had election night last night, so didn't get too much sleep, as I'm sure you guys didn't either. But yeah. excited to, to talk about some journalism stuff. And when they're talking, I'm going to be sharing this Facebook Live link out. So if you see me on my phone, I promise it's for a good cause. <laughs> but go ahead. I'm Susan Tevin. I'm the news assignment editor for WOUB News, but I do a whole lot of other things. I report, uh, I do audio stories. We do audio, web, and TV. We have a student-run news program on uh, public access called W uh, called Newswatch. Wow. Uh, and I just do a lot of reporting. We have a group of four. We all try to pitch in, do a bunch of things. Uh, we all try to do it together. So uh, we run all the time. We don't have a publishing schedule. So check us out at woub.org, Facebook, Twitter, all those good things. Nice plug. Thank you. I'm Sarah Holly. I'm the managing editor of the Daily Sentinel newspaper in Meigs County. Um, we are a five day a week newspaper. Election night was also last night for us, so very little sleep, busy yeah. day <laughs> type stuff. Um, we cover, as managing editor, I am also the main reporter for the county, so I'm out at meetings, out at events, pretty much anything that goes on in the county, as well as handling research, investigative journalism, anything like that. Um, I did ask Susan before I scheduled it the day after the election, and she said it was okay. <laughs> yeah. I did tell her we would be a little loopy right now. <laughs> yeah, usually, usually the Wednesday after an election night is actually pretty like. Yeah. It's a good. Trying to get day, us on so Monday, it's, we it's get not, a little yeah. weird. But... It's not too bad. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so we just we pulled this together. Susan and I worked together to schedule it because, um, of course, there's been uh, this growing kind of feeling of fake news and it's hard to tell what's real and true and, and we've talked about that from a library perspective and we work with students a lot to find um, what they consider you know, what's credible information but I think we don't ever hear that much about it from the perspective of people who are creating information um, so we really wanted a chance to kind of hear from people who do that so um, I guess first question I had was just like what does it look like to um, do training to be a journalist like what do you learn about research or not to make you sum up the whole curriculum but i mean like what are the important things you learn about doing research for journalism yeah. well i was just gonna say susan not only having gone through it herself she is in a good position at wub to be able to train new journalists at ou so you'd be you'd be in a good position to answer this yeah well both of us went to ou mm -hmm. uh graduated from the journalism school so we kind of had the same not the same but uh we're consistent training. Um, a lot of the training is involved in uh, things that you can't really control as far as news judgment and that kind of thing. It's when you're learning about writing and things, that's the stuff you can control. It's not until you get into the actual news world that you learn, okay, this is the kind of thing that people want to hear about. This is the kind of thing that people think is a very sensitive topic that you should really, news judgment sort of thing. So in school, I would say we learned, obviously, writing, diagramming sentences. I even learned from Drew Everts, if anybody remembers her. <laughs> um, and just, I remember going to city council meetings. One of my classes was, the one that I remember the most was um, going, Dr. Tom Suttis, actually, uh, going to city council meetings and learning, you know, how all that works. And you're not necessarily knowing, you know, all the topics, what's the most popular thing to talk about, but how it, uh, a government actually works and how to figure out how to write so that people can relate to that instead of just writing, like I did cops and courts, writing the legal jargon and all that stuff. That's the sort of stuff you have to learn how to write so that you can relate to a certain group and certain demographic. Yeah, there's there's obviously a spectrum, right, on on college majors between ones that are more heavily focused to the classroom and ones that are more out and about and really hands-on learning. I, I would think that journalism falls more on the latter side. 
um, obviously it's a four year degree, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of training in the, in the classroom, like, like Susan said of the generic stuff, like learning grammar and things, um, other, other different tools and, and things that, that you can learn in different classrooms. Some journalism classes are really specialized. I know mm -hmm. OU has like a one for environmental and biology mm -hmm. and stuff. So how, how do you report on an environmental story that might be different than how you would on say a political or like a crime story? Mm -hmm. So there, there's some specialized things that you can learn in a classroom for, for a journalism degree. But for the most part, I, I, I know OU does, and I, I graduated from Bowling Green State University. They do pretty much every journalism school will will mandate having some type of internship, something that you can actually go out and, and do it before you graduate. You're gonna be in a newsroom for a semester, for a summer, et cetera, and do the job. And and it's it's twofold. One, learning, and, and two, you really get a sense of if you actually enjoy it and like it a lot, because there's a lot of people that will start out in journalism as, as an 18 year old or a freshman, and, and you think, oh, I, I like CNN, I like Anderson <laughs> Cooper, right? And then you you go into a newsroom and it's hey call the call the sheriff because somebody just got arrested right, and, or cover a duck race an inflatable duck race or or, or going to a <laughs> going to a bank robbery or something and you know pretty quickly like okay yeah this is this is what I love this is what what I enjoy or or not so hopefully you fall into the love category and and obviously we three have but yeah I'd say that's really that's really the bulk of of the journalism training and and obviously there's student newspapers you can get kind of a real life experience as you're doing it. Yeah. And I think part of what we're talking about is transition uh, from what we learned. I like to say that when I when we were in school, they told us to specialize, specialize, specialize. That was all that I ever heard was find something that you like and write about it all the time. By the time I graduated, they said, do whatever you can to get a job. <laughs> but now we're learning, you know, we've got to do social media. We have to do, uh, we have to do like, OU has a grid lab where you can do 360 video, you can do animations, you can do all these things. WOUB, we, for election coverage, we did Facebook Live cuts every, so every, they had it timed out for, we would do a certain topic at a certain time, all straight to Facebook Live. I mean, you know, you got to do online, you got to make sure everybody's coming to your web page and all that stuff that we mm -hmm. didn't quite get to learn until after we right. started. See, that, that's kind of the interesting thing on, on our age group of journalism students that are that are coming up is I, I was a freshman in 2009 when social media is just starting to turn the corner Twitter and Facebook and etc and and a lot of that multimedia stuff is coming into play with not just the curriculum but in real life newsrooms mm -hmm. it, like there had always been a website for the past 10 15 years before that but not wasn't a huge integral part of a, of a news organization and not to bore with my life story, but I, I started out as a freshman as a as broadcast major, radio broadcast. I wanted to do that. Really? And I, yeah, for, for like, for like about six hours, my freshman year, I was a radio <laughs> broadcast major. And the first day I went in and saw the actual switchboard and everything, I was like, no, no. <laughs> not, not for me at all. I can't do the technical side at all. So I, so my easy thought was, okay, I'll do print journalism. All I need is a pen and a paper, right? <laughs> I was sorely mistaken. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's not too technical with Facebook Live or using a phone and, and multimedia and a recorder. You know, it's not it's not too technical, but you know, there there's the multimedia side of of a print reporter now in 2017. Mm -hmm. That if you looked at the curriculum and you looked at how a journalist was trained in 1957 it just is totally different but that's that's the kind of beauty of the of the industry is that it's it's always shifting and changing so mm -hmm. i know for me i started out with a focus in public relations and it was actually the news writing class where we got sent out in the field and had to sit in in court hearings um, that really kind of changed my mind on what i wanted to do um, i've spent a lot of time doing cops and court reporting that is definitely my favorite thing to do um, next to sports which mm -hmm is what I did my first two years out of school with sports reporting. So I've done a little bit of it all, but definitely the hands-on experience that you get through the journalism school is what prepares you. So this makes, I have a question about the, like the specifics versus the general, and it sounds like you mm -hmm. all have to write, like you could be writing about anything, yes. especially in a small town where mm -hmm. you could be covering a duck race or, <laughs> you know, some sort and of- And a bank robbery on the same day, you never yeah. know. <laughs> get a good grounding? Is that just an experience mm -hmm. thing? Or like what like what would happen if there was like some sort of environmental thing that came up and you need to know about the science of like this mm -hmm. thing that was happening? Like how do you approach that part of the process? Like learning enough to do reporting without going down the rabbit hole of like a four-year mm -hmm. degree? Like how, yeah. that, how do you balance that? I find it's 
it's not playing dumb, but people appreciate if you ask them questions. Like, if you don't know something, right. pretending like you know something isn't going to make them respect you or anything. So if you're at a scene and it's like uh, like the fire we had in West Virginia, uh, I had no idea what air quality tests were, what all that stuff was until I read about it. So I would be the one saying, can you explain what this means, what air quality testing is, why, why we do it, what are we looking for? Because that will make people say, oh, you just you want information that I actually can give you. You don't want just the, how is this happening? Why are we doing this and all this stuff? So I, it, it helps to just ask the questions that you think maybe are dumb questions, but people want to know. Yeah, there's, there's obviously a best case scenario of you going into a situation and being an expert on on whatever it is, but there, there's obviously an element of, of curiosity in the personality mm -hmm. of people that go into this field. I'm I don't think you'd find them any journalists that say, I don't like to ask questions. I don't like to learn new things. Mm -hmm. And so on that point of, of if, if you're not a sciencey person, I'm definitely not. Um, I'm more the, the writing and that side mm -hmm. of the brain side. But, you know, it, there's sort of an element of you're going into a store and you kind of know, you sort of know what it is you need to know by the end. You, you know the question that needs answered. You just obviously don't know the answer. Right? And so as you're learning it, you translate from what they're teaching you to what you're teaching to the audience, whether it's in print or broadcast or however you're getting that story out, that can kind of be the fun, interesting mm -hmm. process of, hey, here's here's something I learned as a as a reporter, and let me report right. it out to you, and, and you can learn too. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of the personality of this. Yeah, and the answer to the question or the question you were asking may change. You're like, wait a second, actually, this is the important part. Sure. Never be afraid to ask questions. There are no dumb questions that you can ask um, when you're trying to find out information about something. And it helps to know your sources as well. Make the connection. If you have a local environmental person, make that connection before you need to use them for a story. Get to know the people that you're going to be working with or that you're going to need for sources. And that way they'll trust you more and you'll trust them. And it works out for the best. Oh, yeah. I have had plenty of times where they've called me and said, I know that you're going to be asking about this and I know mm -hmm. that you're, you want to yep. do this right. So here's what you need to know. Here's mm -hmm. what we're what the part that probably the public is not going to understand maybe as much as somebody behind the scenes would. So it's very much a lot of relationship building with yes. people who are going to give you Definitely. information. Mm -hmm. yeah. What happens if that person's not there though? Like I'm just imagining like, you know, I need to write this story about the thing and you know, today I don't have a person who I can ask. Do you like turn to the internet yeah, we, then or like? Yeah, we call of, those Fridays. Yeah. <laughs> Or day before a holiday yeah. or anything Let's like call that. it lots of pleading looks at the desk. No. Um, it, yeah, I was just going to say, there's there's an element of creativity that comes in. Mm -hmm. um, you would prefer it not be so pigeonholed of this is the person to ask, and if they're not available, then I'm out of luck type mm -hmm. of thing. You know, mm -hmm. and, as for, like, could you use other types of sources with, with, like, the Internet and stuff? And I think one of the questions we're going to get into later is how, how this research process differs from the process of doing research papers. So I just remember growing up and you talk about, you need five different sources and three of them need to be print and two of them can be internet, right? Those types of things. Um, obviously we kind of prefer people sources because in the journalism field, we just, we like people. I think people that read stories like to read about people and what they have to say. Um, obviously there's documents and stuff that come into it with with crime reporting. There's so much of, of criminal paperwork and, and legal paperwork that just comes into it. But yeah, there's there's an element of creativity of, can I find this source elsewhere? Or if I can't reach this person, is there another person? Or, mm -hmm. you know, you find a way. A lot of your bigger agencies and organizations, things like that will have a backup person or someone that they defer to if they're not around. Um, so it's usually best just to go ahead and reach out to that person um, by email, a lot of times there's an automatic reply. I'll direct you to somebody else or phone calls, things like that. And they can point you in the right direction. Yeah, that goes back to having your sources. If your sources know, oh, I'm going to be gone. This is the person you need to talk to. That really helps. Right. So I guess what's a good lead into the question of then? So having done you know, undergraduate academic research mm -hmm. or what you know about how people do academic research, so what, um, for someone who doesn't know anything about what you do as research, aside from the people thing, is there anything different that we should know about um, like the journalistic research process, especially for those of us who work in academics. Like I do a lot of work with a lot of people mm -hmm. who need the three sources and they need to be journal articles That's and right. 
you know, we're not going to use Wikipedia. Yeah, <laughs> and the that, primary right. sources. And yeah, yes. or, yeah. So um, how is that different for you? The library is always a great source. I know I work a lot with our library in Meigs County as far as looking up historic information. We just recently did a series of articles on one of our school districts turned 50. Oh, wow. Um, so I used the library for my source. They had old yearbooks, old newspapers, things like that on microfilm. And so that, that makes it really easy um, when they can help you. You call the library and they say, hey, we have this that you could use. And that helps. It provides you with multiple sources that way in some, in some circumstances. In terms of the practice of it, we actually were talking about this because I'm doing academic research for my grad program and working as a journalist and uh, it's Poor you i know <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> i'm fine it's totally different because we were talking about how um in journalism you, something happens you may not know the question that you want need to ask or the answers mm -hmm. that you actually need going into it but when you're doing academic research a lot of times here's the question that i want to answer how do i find the answer to that question or not the how do I find mm -hmm. that that's not truly the answer but when you're in journalism it's you, you just go almost blind and say I need to find the information whatever the information is and mm -hmm. do it that way so that's kind of how it's different yes yeah, so, so much of journalism is is reactionary it's just kind of the nature of the business is something happens and we're here to report on it mm -hmm. um, there's other obviously types of stories of, of previewing things or we call them evergreen stories which are maybe not timely stories but a how is something affecting blank? You know, mm -hmm. some, maybe something that's a little different news path than just um, a car ran into the building and now I need to find out what right. what happened right. type of thing. So, so there's there's that part of it is how it differs is how you're going into the into the process of whatever research it is. Mm -hmm. I, I think almost now skipping ahead to the end result, I think has a has a difference too. Is in an academic paper, you're you're almost writing. So oftentimes, I think Susan can attest to this, on a really technical basis, and you're trying to build all of these sources together, and, and oftentimes dozens or, or hundreds into a very exhaustive research report or whatever, and you, you got these building blocks, right, and you're, you're creating this whole however, 20, 50, 100 page report or whatever. So much in journalism is about condensing down. Um, you know, we deal with I don't say short stories, but stories of two to 500 words oftentimes. Mm -hmm. You might have a longer feature story or maybe a longer dive. They call it an online a long read. Is that mm -hmm. the, the name of it? Like a long <laughs> feature story like that. So you, you, might have, you, might, yeah. you might have that, but so oftentimes it's you've got a story of two or three or four sources, maybe one or two if it's very good, and you're condensing down and parsing down language so that an everyday reader can understand wow. this, that comes up so much in crime of yes. mm -hmm. there's so much technical language if you sat in on a courtroom story how do I write this so that mm -hmm. it can be well understood whereas in a, in a research paper you're writing for your PhD professor etc it's yeah, you literally it's assume people know what you're talking about yeah yeah I mean then that's what I found too um, for academic research you're trying to make it's almost like working in law you're trying to make an argument mm -hmm. and here's this proof that this argument should be a thing and in journalism it's i'm the journalism that i do and i think what the general philosophy is supposed to be for journalism is here's the facts that's it you yes. decide what you interpret this you interpret this however you want to but i'm just giving you the facts that i got from these sources in the way that you can relate to it so. completely fact-based leave your opinion out of it that's unless it's an core. editorial yeah that's the core that's right. of journalism yeah, you might come into, say, an academic research with, as you're saying, a theory or mm -hmm. something personal. It's not, not so much that you're deliberately inserting yourself into mm -hmm. the knowledge and into the facts. It's just you come in with an idea. Mm -hmm. In journalism, you typically don't. So. Right. So, um, so how do you, I mean, I, I'm not sure anyone could ever remove themselves from the facts of the situation. Mm -hmm. So I guess I come from research from a perspective of, like, you're always part of that process like you can you're still part of this society you're part of this local community yeah, reflexivity yeah yes there we go thank you um <laughs> so like how what steps do you take to try to as remove yourselves as much as possible and like in especially in the case where it's something that's local to you or something you care about like it just how do you try to manage that uh basically i've had this happen a lot and i 
remember Tyler was working on the Vinton, we were working on the Vinton County grocery store story, uh, which is still going on. Stay tuned. Um, we were, he was super excited. He's, they've all been waiting four years for this to happen. And he was like bouncing up and down and all this stuff. And I was thinking about that, but it's, I find when it's a story that either is a personal experience or a personal interest to me or something that I've been watching for a while, like a long court case or something. Mm -hmm. I go into it even more of, I need to find more facts. I need to find more things to write about instead of this is how I feel. So, because I'm so afraid of getting into, I think the opinions and how I feel about things that I'm like, no, I just need to find more facts. So more people are interested in this, uh, but in a, I guess a subtle way of here, have this information, get interested in this sort of thing and more factual information. All right. I think the stories that you're closer to and have a personal investment in, you'll invest more time and effort into researching and finding your information and things like that. But it's always important that the general public never knows how you feel about it. That your writing doesn't come across as I'm for this levy or I'm against this levy or I'm against this person that's on trial. Mm -hmm. um, you have to just lay the facts out there, dig into it, get as much facts as you can but never let them know how you feel. And then you really have to watch social media posts. Right. Um, social media can really give away your opinions very quickly. And people are going to take what they want out mm -hmm. of the opinions, out of the uh, stories anyway, that you're presenting this because you have a particular agenda anyway. So. Right. Yeah, to kind of plus one what they're saying of just trying to channel possibly a, a passion, if you want to use that word, for a subject or just for general news and just overall. I mean, it, it's obvious that people that go into journalism and people that go into this type of field, they obviously care about current events and care about the news. So it, it wouldn't really make sense for someone in our position, whether it's the lowest, smallest circulation paper in, in the country or in Anderson Cooper, anywhere on that spectrum, it wouldn't really make sense if they were totally detached from the news as far as having an interest in the news. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about you particularly want a levy to pass. That's more specific. I just, mm -hmm. just in general, if you're a basketball reporter, you probably like basketball. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just stands to reason. So it, so if you kind of frame it in that context, like they said, channeling your whatever your feelings about it into, okay, I want to really hone in on this subject or hone in on this issue. We, we bring up the environmental thing again. People that really love environment love environmental reporting. And whether they believe or don't believe in climate change or a specific issue, they love to delve into it and, and obviously write about it. So, mm -hmm. so that's that's really the main thing. I, I would say on a local, personal level, it's an, it's difficult to entirely detach yourself emotionally to the, the situation that's going on. It kind of just depends on the seriousness of the situation. If you're going out covering some local Christmas event, you're hobnobbing with people it's it is what it is it's fine it's, it's, it's community town. reporting if it's yeah. if you're if you're reporting on a big levy or something like that or something that deals with the crime or the sheriff you probably shouldn't be buddy buddy with the with the sheriff you know it's there's a spectrum on like how rigorous you have to stick to like mm -hmm. the the integrity thing i mean it's yeah and i mean it's 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 a weird balance because you have to you have to be able to uh, be uh, objective and be able to present the facts, but also a community newspaper, more than a metropolitan newspaper, more than, you know, Washington Post, New York Times, need to be sort of chummy with the mm -hmm. community because that's how you get the, the good stories. That's how you get the people to actually read your newspapers is by going to events and by mm -hmm. having an interest in the community that you're writing. So it's sort of presenting the facts and saying, this is all interesting and maybe you should look at it if you don't. And also, this is the community that I really like, and mm -hmm. I want to keep going. So it's it's a weird balance. Yeah, definitely. I, I know this is real quick. We can move on. But I know it's not an apples to apples comparison, but if you think about like a sports broadcast on TV, you've got local announcers, right, for for most of the teams, and it it varies between whether they're they're pretty down the middle or or people that mm -hmm. you know the old White Sox announcer. If they hit a home run, he just lost his mind, right? <laughs> and and it, it's whatever. That's not hard hitting journalism thing. I'm not saying it's great or bad either way. But to the point of a, a community, in this case, listeners of a of a team caring that their people that are reporting on a team care about 
that team mm -hmm. that, that matters to people. So yeah, finding a way to be able to demonstrate your, I guess, passion. level of interest and passion people without mm -hmm. the end product being swayed. Mm -hmm. That's a challenge, but mm -hmm. you find you find a way to do it. I think as long as you're genuine, people will understand that you have this job to do, but you also have you also have their interests at heart. Right. So, do you feel like you've gotten a, a like an uptick in um, kind of pushback against like the media is wrong, the media is fake, like the media, like you're getting is it you're getting is it getting harder to talk to people? Um, has it run into that and more of this like kind of cultural sense of the media is all liberal biased or they're <laughs> whatever direction biased right. or you know like yeah. is there, have you encountered that kind of in person when you're trying to talk to people? Yeah, or, I mean not necessarily in person, but you know when you're trying to reach right. out to. Students. I think some of the local sources that we we know very well and work with on a regular basis will make some kind of a comment jokingly. Um, something about, you know, the fake news or something like that. Mm -hmm. And and we know that they're kidding and it's just it's just kind of, you know, it's out there on the national level. At the local level, we're still trying to get our local stories out, keep it fact based, but at the same time it has to be brought up. Yeah. It's interesting being an NPR affiliate. So you get both sides. Oh, yeah. We're very much the <laughs> even keel, or we're very much the liberal not. So, but yeah, I mean, WEB as a thing is a is a local media outlet. Mm -hmm. So we don't, you know, adhere to. We have to do what NPR is doing right now. Um, I noticed in the last election that you know we had a lot of people. Oddly, we had a lot of people willing to talk about you know political things, but we had a lot of people not willing to talk about things. And we got into this interesting dilemma where we tried to cover as much as possible. We tried to get Republicans and Democrats, I mean, as equally as you can. Mm -hmm. I'm not, you're not going to get an equal amount of people at the same event as you mm -hmm. usual. So a lot of people on one side, I'll say, didn't really want to talk. They, they thought that they were going to be ostracized. They thought their ideals were outside of the norm. Um, so naturally, we got a lot of people on the other side that wanted to talk and said, this is how the thing should be, and blah, 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 blah. And then you get people calling and saying, well, why aren't you covering the other side? <laughs> right. And uh, I was like, well, we're trying. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting to try to cover that. And I would get people that were completely against reporters and completely against the media. And it really came down to just keeping them and in this case, this example that I'm thinking of, keeping them on the phone and saying, well, I just, I, I genuinely want to know what your interests are. Because th in this area, the problems are not, is this person a white nationalist? Is this person a yeah. person that will, a wealthy person? We don't have a lot of that going on. Right. We have, is this person going to give me jobs? Is this person going to make manufacturing come back? Coal mining, is that all? I mean, you have to come down to the level where you are, what, where you're doing your reporting and say, I understand that a lot of people are saying that we need jobs, we need coal mining. And then they start to say, well, yeah, actually, that's exactly what I want. And that's what I think. By the end of it, I would get people that would say, well, I'm glad you called me. And I, I appreciated this conversation. So, I mean, it's just a matter of like we're saying about community, acting like you're interested mm -hmm. in things and, and actually wanting to know what they want to say mm -hmm. instead of assuming. So, so a lot of points here. Uh, on the first side of it, we're kind of lucky in that on a local reporting basis, and I speak generally here, a lot of the stuff we report about is pretty nonpartisan. I mean that both in a literal sense with political party, there are local offices that, that are not partisan. And in a broad sense, when you write about poverty, there's no like this side or that side. It's we're trying to no, solve but, poverty. Yes, <laughs> sure. I mean, I mean, ge just generally speaking, a lot of local issues, and this this goes for anywhere, whether you're in a red state or a blue state. If you're a random reporter in the middle of Arizona and you're just reporting on the local basketball team and the local sheriff and the local whatever, it's not about partisan whatever. Mo mostly because of on the scale that you're reporting on. If you go on the, the larger side, and, and we're not all large newspapers, but in situations that we have been in those higher arenas, uh, having covered for the messenger and the courier, went to a Trump rally last year in mm -hmm. 2016, and suddenly I'm sitting next to a New York Times reporter and et cetera, right? And mm -hmm. Trump 
does the normal thing in his in his rally where he stops and tells everybody to to turn around and go mm-hmm. yell at the media, right? So there were times that that's probably one of the few times ever in my reporting career, four or five plus years, that I've just had somebody actively like just turn around, and just give the middle finger for no mm-hmm. reason, like has never met us, doesn't know us at mm-hmm. all. So that that's just at the end of the spectrum. It's a different context, really. But I don't I don't think there's that many times that a local newspaper should have to or will have to deal with a lot of people worrying about these large no. biases. If they're, right. if the paper's doing good and, and the reporters are doing a decent job reporting on stuff, no one's saying that there's much issue there. Yeah, most of what you're getting is, why didn't you cover that inflatable duck race or something? <laughs> it's, not, it's, really the, there's, it's not that often that I get a call saying, the messenger's too liberal, the messenger's too conservative with the local reporting. It's, it's more if, if anyone's complaining, it's usually either like, you took out this comic strip I love, <laughs> Or, or Where's my yeah, why, puzzle? why, right. why did, you know, you, you covered this event last year. Why didn't you right. coming yeah. in this year? I will, I will say one thing about just news literacy in general, and I'm sure they have a lot to say about this too, is the, the complaints that I've gotten about either the messenger, the courier being one side or another doesn't have to do with the local reporting, but has to do with the other stuff that comes in the paper, right? So papers all across the country, they run the local stuff and they have wire services, Associated Press, mm-hmm. Tribune, Etc. That that they run with, and and this goes for news stories in the middle of the paper, or it goes in the opinion pages that there's say we we run an op-ed of the Pittsburgh paper and the Dallas paper about anything mm-hmm. politics, environment, sports. We it, it's Breaking it's the news. gamut, right? Mm-hmm. It's half like we just want nice quality coverage of throughout the country, and to be honest, it's kind of page filler. And so we've run a lot of columns about Donald Trump. This might be news to people out there, but he's rather controversial and people like to write about him. Also, he's the president. Um, and, and just another thing, it's if you're an opinion writer, um, which I do a lot of columns as well as just normal fact-based reporting as an editor, it's really, really easy to write about things you don't like. If you've ever listened to a sports radio broadcast or listen to any sports talk or, or sports columns or stuff, people will go crazy on the stuff that they don't like about you got to fire the coach and whatever, mm-hmm. right? And same goes with politics. It's really easy to write about, I don't like what Trump said or did about blank, than it is to write a column about, I really thought that tax policy was great. great. <laughs> it's really hard to kind of do that. So, so the and long perhaps st- that's something we need to improve. The, the, yeah, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's very possible. So the long story short is that we've run columns and political mm-hmm. cartoons. Political cartoons nail both parties. Don't kid yourself. Yes. When it was Obama in office, when it was Clinton in office, they had plenty on that side. But we've so we've gotten calls that said the messenger is biased against Trump. So what do they mean there? Do they mean that columnist from Pittsburgh doesn't like Trump? Or do they think that by virtue of the messenger printing that column that we therefore endorse everything that's in the paper? And a lot of times people can't differentiate between something that's printed in it and the publication itself. So that's been kind of an interesting the last year or so. Um, on the news literacy side is them understanding this gets back to sources and who's saying what as, as people I've gotten more than one call that says I'm canceling my subscription because you wrote about Trump too much. And, and that's another situation where you have to have a conversation with people and say, okay, why is this actually the case? And then explain it to them. And does that help? Oh, I try. I mean, not to get into personal conversations, but you know, I've tried to explain to people that like here we have this wire service and we pull things in. I don't speak done to them. It's just people don't, people don't know the technical side of newspapers and that's fine. That's fine. Um, and, and that's great that people have questions, but you know, I try to explain them. We pull things in just the same. We pull in Garfield, the same type of people (laughs) that write and print the comic Garfield, the same people that write a column in Tucson and we pull it from them. And, people have a hard time understanding that Mm -hmm. just because we print something doesn't mean we necessarily agree with it. And it might not necessarily be us. It might Mm -hmm. be a Pittsburgh guy, but that's, that's been a challenge. We have lots of discussions at WAUB about that. We don't print, but we have social media and, you know, when a national thing happens, when a like tax reform is being discussed, we retweet NPR, we retweet the Washington Post, whoever we retweet, um, we have discussions about whether this looks like we're on one side of an issue or on another side of an issue. We have a lot of discussions about how often should we be posting these national things because we are a local 
station and we need to be focused on local and how can we localize this instead of just sharing mm -hmm. it so when we have national stuff on our social media it's because we want to get something out first and then we will go back and say okay how how does this affect us locally how can we make this um more relatable for the people that live mm -hmm. down here so i agree uh that just makes me think of the difference between like i think it's like social media is just such a one point in time like i may see that national story but then i don't see your follow-up maybe mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. how this affects people in ohio so um i guess that it, I mean, that's more a statement for, for there's something for discussion the idea that um like you're, you're talking to people about this one thing that you published and does that mean we're biased like, are you trying, do you ever go back and try to look at, like an academic would go and look at all your paper or they do a content analysis or random sample and say, oh, we don't have time for that. So let, <laughs> so, but I'm guessing that's not part of your no. Well, so, let, so lucky for this conversation, I, I, after I got a couple of those Trump calls, I actually did that. I, I wrote a column right. about the process of me looking back into this and hearing about it. And I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but the gist was I, I did like a 30 day sample. It's not a huge sample, but it's, you know, it's 30 days of papers. You get a good sense of what the opinion page is like on a, on a daily basis. It was something like, like if there was 30 or 40 columns plus political cartoons that related to Trump, I tried to section them out into what you would call a negative column. And you, you pretty much well know where the writer stands. Some that are negative, some that are positive, and there were some, and some that are just neutral, like, like right as the hurricane hit uh, in Puerto Rico, there was a column like Trump, Trump should uh, have leadership and help out Puerto Rico. It wasn't like a, he hasn't been and should be. It was, it was totally neutral. Con so there, there are some columns that are like right in between. So there was a split on all the three of those, positive, neutral, negative. Obviously there was more negative than positive, but it wasn't like, it wasn't like 30 to one. It was like 25 negative and like 10 positive and like five or 10 neutral. So it was definitely one-sided, but it was down the middle. But here's the thing, our, our people that pull these columns in, they're just pulling from the whole syndicate and they're just kind of grabbing off the shelf, right? It's not a case of we're specifically seeking out mm -hmm. this or yeah. that. So here, so, so as I conclude with my column, you basically have two options if you're a news outlet like us with this question. You can either A, pull from the representative sample, which Donald Trump right now has a 39% approval rating. It stands to reason if you took 100 columns, 39% would be positive and 61 would be negative. That's just mm -hmm. kind of arithmetic, right? Or you can selectively seek out an absolute 50-50 down the middle of positive and negative. But could it, you? you know, I, I think if you looked hard enough, you probably could. I, I have no qualm that there's positive articles out there written every day from around the country of whatever wire service we're in. But, but that was, that was basically the, I don't know if it's an ethical or moral question, but just a, just a strategy of how we deliver the, the news and the wire service. And, and it's my thought that it's not honest to selectively edit and give a 50, 50 to demonstrate throughout the country. Some people say this, some people say that. No, if a hundred people are saying one thing and two people are saying the other, I don't think it's honest to give, a 50 50 but that's that's my approach as an editor you guys might disagree other editors around the country might disagree i think that's just our approach and it's it's been it's been hard for people to understand but i think generally most people get it and at the same time you're going to get it from both sides people you're covering you're covering i don't know you're covering hillary too much or you're covering donald trump too much yeah. or whatever yeah. uh it's sort of a you just have to sort of roll with it almost you have to decide mm -hmm. okay we're going to get this from both sides we just have to decide is this in our judgment having done this for a few years um representative like he was saying is this something where we can say we have done both sides we have seen the neutral side this has all been covered mm -hmm. we're not overdoing one way or the other and i mean that's just sort of something with all the other things that everybody has to do during the day, we all have to decide what we're consuming. We all have to decide what we're producing. So. I know being in a more conservative county with Meigs County, um, last year I came over when Bill Clinton was in town and covered his speech here when he was campaigning. Um, and we got some negative feedback. You know, why are you covering this Democrat? 
Um, but then on the reverse side, when President Trump was in Huntington earlier in the year, we get some negative comments on why would you go cover that? So, so I guess either way, um, news is news, whether people feel like it, it's yeah. relevant to them or their political affiliation, a former president or a president being within an hour of you is still news. Yeah. Just the, the fact that their <laughs> presence is here. Right. I mean. that, that itself is news. Yeah. And, and we have, we were actually at WUB, we're discussing how presumptuous it, presumptuous it is of us to think everybody's going directly to our page where they're not just scrolling and seeing mm -hmm. these stories. Uh, okay, are we showing the same story over and over again or do we need to show the story because we need to make sure people know we're paying attention? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an everyday battle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, there, so there's the example I gave about the, about the wire service and that's kind of not our direct news reporting, but I'll, I'll give you an example of that kind of scenario in real life what we do. So, so on this subject of somebody, somebody coming, mm -hmm. So we, we had four years ago, 20, was it 2014, that Ed Fitzgerald would be running against Kasich for, yes. for the governor. Fitzgerald had an 88 county strategy. In Vinton County, least populated county in Ohio, he came two or three times, which is mm -hmm. kind of a surprise. Mm -hmm. and he came to the fair and I did a story walking around the fair with him. And, and, and you kind of do that story where it's, it's about the governor's race, but it's also like a, hey, Ed Fitzgerald came to town type of story. Mm -hmm. So Governor Kasich, for whatever, for whatever you think of him, he didn't, he has not come to Vinton County. So the question is, do I write a story about Ed Fitzgerald and that's the end of the story, or do I write a, and here's also John Kasich and I do a whole big thing on him. That's a news judgment thing. And you might have one reporter, one editor that, that writes the Ed Fitzgerald story where 200 words is about Ed's thing. And then the other 200 are, and here's what John Kasich has been doing in the governor's office, blah, 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 blah. Or how I did it, which is, you know, explaining the race, but the story is about Ed Fitzgerald because he mm -hmm. came. That's not a, it's a question of how you view the news judgment. Right. Yeah. There's not a right or a wrong mm -hmm. answer. It's just right. different preferences, I guess. Yeah. And it's, it's the same discussion we have with anyone. If, if we live, I mean, we both work where there's OU's campus. So we have a lot of speakers that show up. Like I'm thinking of Milo, what's his last can't, name? Yiannopoulos. Yiannopoulos. I can't think how you say We it. had long discussions about whether we were going to cover that. And it wasn't even a matter of what his stances were one way or the other. It's this person is coming to speak to, I think it was the OU Republicans. Yeah. Somebody that was a specific group. Would we cover Joe Schmo that was coming for the same reason? Or are we covering this because people are telling us this is going to be a big thing? And it ended up not being a big thing. And we said, no, we wouldn't cover this um, if someone wants to, since we are a student run newspaper and we pride ourselves on doing practical experience. If they wanted to do it as a practice thing, absolutely. But nobody was available. And we decided that that wasn't really a thing that we needed to cover. Um, yeah, for the for the yeah. context on that. So the, the smile, he's a speaker, he's not a candidate, he's not, there's not some type of race or no. some type of election. It was the election. day after the election, wasn't it? it it's, yeah, it's the a, it's a private before. speaker that, that came in. And so that's, yeah, that's your, that's your news judgment question. Now, if he's a candidate of a local race or something, it probably makes it a lot easier. Mm -hmm. It's not just a bombast that makes you not want to cover him. It's, right. it's, it's the, he's bombastic. And he's just a private speaker. Does right. that warrant the level of reporting? And as you, as people might have seen at the time, of the five or ten outlets, if you include the student papers and the, mm -hmm. the you know the alternative kind of outlets, some did, some didn't. Yeah, we we didn't. The other paper did. It's, right. And that's okay. That's it is okay to have these differences of, mm -hmm. thing. And that's why journalism is great is that it's not so black and white sometimes. Right. And it's the same with dealing with um, cases like sexual assault cases that have sensitive means. We had the um, Chase Bank uh, sexual assault case that went through and it was covered all over social media. Absolutely. We had a big long discussion about a certain uh, particular sexual assault case that's still pending, I guess, um, recently. And we talked about, you know, would you have run this? And I, but we ran it, they didn't for a while. What were the what were the decisions that were made? No one was charged. Does that matter? Harvey Weinstein isn't charged. Do we want to go to that round? You know, it's 
actually I love having these discussions because it gets me to talk with other reporters and see what our peers are doing. Mm -hmm. But also it's, well, where do I stand? This? Is this something where I have a personal bent on this? And I think this needs to be covered, so we need to cover it however we can cover it, or is this something that actually needs to be covered? And uh, so you, you do, the reporters sometimes have to check themselves mm -hmm. and say, no, my boss actually says, you're in your feelings. Yeah. You, you wanna cover this because you're in your feelings. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, yes, that's actually true and someone else should do it. Mm -hmm. Someone yeah, else should do it or not do it. I wanna just add one last point to this and kick it to Sarah, because I think she'd have <laughs> something to say on this, is, you can take this is this is what this is what I try to explain to people when when perhaps and I, and again I think at a local level I don't think anybody thinks that WUB and the messengers filled the room with people and cigars are thinking how how can I use my bias for this political party or something to cigars shape my reporting it it is so much of a very honest well-meaning people trying to report the news that the best that they feel that they can. And it's conversations every day mm -hmm. about every story and even stuff that's innocuous of, okay, we know we're going to do it. How should we do it? How, how can we respect the people involved the best way? Or how can we serve the readers in the best way? It's honest, well-intentioned conversations that might lead to decisions that readers or people don't agree with, mm -hmm. but that ultimately come from a good place. And that gets into the issues of trust and the community respecting the outlet and and things like that. But it's not it's not a smoke filled room, not at, not at the local level at all. No. Um, I know we get calls in the office with people saying, this is going on, why haven't you reported on this? Somebody broke in my house, why aren't you reporting on this? Um, and we do, we run a weekly for the record with the sheriff's reports and things like that. We do not list the name of a person unless they're charged mm -hmm. and people do not understand that. Um, but until you're criminally charged, in our opinion as a newspaper, your name shouldn't be out there. Once you are charged, indicted, convicted, yes, your name is fair game. Does that become a public record? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And it would be public record on a police report if they're investigating someone too. But say they investigate and they find out, no, this person didn't do it. Then we've put their name out there in connection with a burglary that they may have had nothing to do with. Um, but if, if they are charged and, in, and then indicted and go to trial or something like that and are found innocent, we report on that as well. Mm -hmm. So then we've reported that their name has been cleared. But we don't want to put somebody out there that, you know, this person allegedly broke mm -hmm. in a house mm -hmm. if they didn't have anything to do with it. And I think there's gray areas. I think if you get 10,000 different journalists in a room, mm -hmm. you're going to get 10,000 right. different this answers. Is, this, is, this is the really the beauty of it and, and why it's great, but it's that people should understand is that just because one newspaper does it a certain way, it doesn't necessarily make it the absolute only way or, right. or the best way. That's Which just is their, not to say that we policy. don't have standards. Yeah, so there's there's general practices mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that hopefully most most outlets, regardless of the type of medium, whether it's print or broadcast or radio, right. et cetera, will follow. But even those, the, there's there's places that will say, no, you can't name an underage person that's charged with a crime, even if they're already charged with stuff. Some newspapers say, mm -hmm. no, absolutely, they're underage, can't do it. I interned for a paper in Northern Ohio that if a seven-year-old got arrested for a crime, they'd name them. So, yeah. it, it, so this gets back to the thing of when people say the media, I don't know what they mean because <laughs> there's, because no. every, there's such a difference of, of, mm -hmm. of style and, and a state and then approaches it is so different than how Vinton County Courier is going to approach mm -hmm. it. So when there's, when there's talk of the media or of fake news, I literally don't know what they mean because it's such a nebulous mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. accusation that there's so many different types of media yeah. out there that that you can't classify what we do in local local newspapers, local agencies and organizations are so different than what the national level does. And while there is that universal standard that we follow, decisions might be different at a local level than they would be mm -hmm. on a national level. And so just what I would say to, to bookend that point, we get to another question to wrap up is is that take take these different outlets and take the different reporters and stuff at their own face value mm -hmm. and look into what types of, of standards and practices and experience and stories they've written 
and make your own call as a reader or a listener on on whether you value the work and the service they do or whether you don't but you can't look at it all in the same broad brush you can't mm -hmm. you can't determine whether or not you respect the cnn the same way you would respect the athens messenger you just can't yeah. and so different outlets are going to have different purposes and different different you know theories and ways and, and and things that they report on we're local papers we concentrate on the local national concentrates on the national you mm -hmm. just look at it each individually and make your own choices i guess from there as a news consumer mm -hmm. And I would say ask questions. I mean, we get calls all the time anyway. Might as well yeah. be someone saying, hey, if you genuinely want to know, a good reporter will be able to say, okay, this is why I decided that this was an important story to do. Mm -hmm. This is why I decided to do it this way. Mm -hmm. They have time if they if you shoot them an email, I would say any good reporter, I would tell any student, be, be willing to defend your work because mm -hmm. you have to do this every day. You have to face these things every day. You have to know you have the fortitude to do that so can you guys think not to put you on the spot can you think of a time that because it's happened to me that someone has called in with a with a question or a, let's say a complaint or something but they might have pretty good merit they might have been right or might have changed yeah. your mind about something it's it's happened to me yeah definitely. many times i've had that i mean not necessarily that i needed to print a correction or anything but that mm -hmm. they said okay i can't think of anything specific at the moment mm -hmm. but of course because i'm on the spot but you know, I've had those calls all the time where mm -hmm. you covered this this way, but you don't even know this side of it. And I said, yeah, I don't know that side because I didn't have anyone, yeah. I didn't have access to anybody yeah. to tell me that side. Mm -hmm. If you'd like to tell me that, please. I do that all the time. I have an open policy as a journalist myself to say, call me if you think something is weird. If you think I've done something mm -hmm. inaccurate, let me know. We'll talk about it. Maybe it's not inaccurate. Maybe it is. If it's inaccurate, mm -hmm. by all means. I will change it because I don't want to have a story hanging in the air that's wrong. But just come talk to me. I mean, people seem to think that there's this like bulletproof glass between the reporter <laughs> just, and the talker, and you're like, no, I'll talk to you. Yeah. I, I just care. hope people don't get the sense, even in the story I told earlier about someone complaining about the Trump and and wire thing. It, you might have a person that calls in, and they might they might just not be accurate that that's fine mm -hmm. but i i hope i don't get the sense that there's any type of adversarial relationship between the media everybody just wants to be heard such yes, as, such then... as the media is to people um mm -hmm. between the readers they serve i mm -hmm. absolutely love for the most part uh people calling in or writing in or emailing in it, good or bad it's it's one of the best parts means, of the job it means you're reading every time i oh, see absolutely. one of those i put thanks for reading and then answer the question <laughs> right. absolutely right whether it's negative or positive reader feedback is a great thing mm -hmm. uh, it makes you know that you're doing a job that people care about that they take the time to read what you're writing and they want to tell you that they hate it or they love it or they want to see more of this or that it just means they care right right it's nice to know that there are people reading it and that sometimes the negative feedback is the only thing you'll ever hear mm -hmm. but it's it, i always thought you get the, so much negative feedback if you get so much negative feedback that one person that says hey you're doing a great job you're like oh i'm paying <laughs> oh, i know yes. <laughs> print it out and hang it on the wall yes. no, but, every, <laughs> but, but everybody gets that how how often does a random police officer a random mcdonald's worker or something get somebody says you know what you cooked a really great right. hamburger or you handled that traffic stop right. extraordinarily well mm -hmm. it's everybody it's everywhere right. it's everywhere so uh, someone asked a specific question about covering the school board race. I'm just going to let you answer that, like, on the comments after. I think it was for you about not covering the school board race. So uh, I'll let you respond to which, that. Which school board? I, I don't know. While you were talking. But, don't uh, get adversarial. I, yeah. No, I, I yeah, just I, I was just know. making sure. And said, people yeah, are we, watching. We, we, um, why didn't you cover the school board race? So I... While you Once again, about, people are watching. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I, I can say and defense of us, I think. Um, we cover all, you know, the Athens Messenger is a county paper. Obviously, Athens City, I think, is the bulk of it just by population and things going on. But we cover all five school boards. And if you look in the Messenger today, there's coverage of all five school board race elections. Um, we generally try to go to as many meetings and, and coverage as we can. We have pretty good relationships with all the superintendents, um, Trimble, Nelson York, Alex, Fedhawk, Athens. We we cover them all. So if, if they mean Athens, um, we've been at every meeting and every facilities thing that they've had. I think Susan yeah. has too. So yeah. almost. Every I, I would I would wonder just what what the specificity of it was. And I think that was 
part of why I brought up that we're a four person newsroom at WOUB because there's only four of us. <laughs> so as much as I, I would love sometime to be, uh, to go to Nelsonville, I covered, when I was at the messenger, I covered Trimble, I think right before she came on. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that was really interesting. I liked watching Trimble's. Mm -hmm. I mean, but, you want to cover everything, mm -hmm. but you can't. You're one but, person. But hey, you've like got four. Else. Holly and I, with I her there. One. I've got I, one of them. I'm, We're just I'm one. It. I, so. I have... I have a reporter one day a week helping me out now. Um, mm -hmm. We share her with a sister paper, and I get her one day a week. Otherwise, I am the full-time news person in Meigs County. So I turned it into a pity party. So it does, it does make trying. it difficult to get to everything. Um, yeah. And we do rely heavily on people um, in those positions, superintendents, village clerks, people like that, to send us the minutes from meetings that we don't mm -hmm. get to. All right, so we're approaching an hour. Uh, thank you all for your time. I just want to I just want to end with one question just to kind of wrap it all up. So I hear you um, talking a lot about like you would like to respond to people, mm -hmm. uh, but it does seem a little bit like you're, it's on the reader to kind of investigate the transparency or to understand, like to contact you or to know, to look at like the whole scope of the mm -hmm. outlet's work to understand right. like, you know, I see one story and that just seems bad, but is it really representative right. of their whole work? So um, do you feel like there's anything like the media as, as it were could do to like promote transparency or um, do you feel like we might be moving in that direction with more effort at like, uh, you know, here are all the documents online that you can look at or, mm -hmm. um, you know, what, if we, what can we do to increase trust and transparency without just putting it on the reader to contact? Well, that's that's a fantastic question, and and the obvious example that just comes to my mind, David Farenthold with the yeah. Washington Post. Oh, he yeah. he won a Pulitzer by basically he had a steno pad, and mm -hmm. for the entirety of the 2016 presidential election, he he would have some type of uh, story idea, and he would basically have this list, and he would put out on Twitter. He started with like 20,000 Twitter followers. By the mm -hmm. end of the election, he had like 250,000 mm -hmm. or more, right? Yeah. And he would say, hey can people help me out with, with blank? Um, and, and there was so much reader interaction and, and want to pull it with it, but mm -hmm. on a local level, yeah, I think that there's, there's things that a paper can do, or I, I say the word paper just cause I'm in such a newspaper mm -hmm. frame. What I mean is local outlets, um, can do to solicit reader interaction. Mm -hmm. Um, do you feel like you get more of that with social media? Like Definitely. We certainly try. Um, that is a never ending mm -hmm. process for us trying to figure out mm -hmm. how to make that as engaging as possible. Mm -hmm. We, we at OUB, WOUB, we talk about that all the time. How do we get more people engaged? Um, like I remember specifically I asked because I was walking around the pawpaw festival and people were talking about, Oh, I, I remember pawpaws. They taste like, vanilla custard or something. Somebody said something weird. And somebody said it tasted like juicy fruit. And everybody was like, no, of course it doesn't. And so I was like, I need to put that on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And we got a lot of engagement. What does a pawpaw taste like? What does a pawpaw taste like? And everybody has a different, and every, right. somebody said, I hate them. And somebody <laughs> said, not enough to come to the pawpaw. I mean, it, yes. you get, anyway. so you hope to get that for everything, for the court cases and for the things that you don't necessarily want to like mm -hmm. have a big discussion about. But it's difficult to figure out. I mean, that's something that newspapers and mm -hmm. outlets have all been trying to figure out how to make for news. I mean, ever. make consumers mm -hmm. want to talk, and we're just like, please talk to us. <laughs> it's such, it's right. such a tough thing because we, like you said, we would love to have the type of balance where it's we're not a news outlet's not on a higher plane or a lower plane. Right. For some things, there's an unavoidable where we're here and we're saying, hey public, here's what you need to know. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that's just kind of the way, and it, it doesn't mean to be broadcast out as a, hey, here's what we know, mm -hmm. <laughs> here's what you should know, right? But Yeah, and you know, they, as much as we do, are busy and mm -hmm. don't have time to look at all the important things that they need to look at. So. That is kind of our, that is kind of our function, is to facilitate mm -hmm. the yes. local flow of information to people. Yeah. I really think I've been doing a lot more Facebook living. <laughs> Um, <laughs> besides this, yeah, and it really does seem to bring a lot of people out. I don't get a lot of comments lately, so please feel free to comment. But like, if I go to local events, like I went to the um, solar eclipse, and you just say, "Here I am." The streets are completely blocked off because all the parking is gone, and they're out of three um, D glasses or eclipse glasses. 
And then I did a video on <laughs> showing them how you make a pinhole viewer. And that got a lot of play. <laughs> so I think it's just, you know, saying, hi, hi, we're here. Mm -hmm. Being being we're there. Like yeah, yeah. Hi, we're so genuine. Funny. We're not just standing in a windowless room trying to type, like he said, smoke-filled room trying to type and get <laughs> yeah. people in trouble. But at the same time, you share what you think is going to be a really big story, and you think it's going to have a lot of feedback, and nobody will comment. Mm -hmm. But then, like we posted on our Facebook page um, for readers to submit trick or treat photos of their kids. Yeah, and I man. get 200 photos. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but I can't get a comment on a yeah. story that's like yeah. a major court case yeah, or something is, like that. It is sometimes a, it, readers respond to different things, mm -hmm. and sometimes there's no way to predict what yeah. they're going to. Yeah, respond to. We had a that may still be a running joke in the messenger newsroom, but <laughs> the apple. Yeah, the apple. Yeah. <laughs> John Halley, the photographer there, took a picture of an apple, posted it on Facebook, said, "This is a really nice apple. What kind of apple?" You I, eat? I promise, there's nothing more than that. Yes. It was just a <laughs> was picture apple. of an what apple kind of on a apple table. Is it? This is a really good apple. And I swear, arguments for days there was about probably, what kind of apple. There's was. probably something like five or six hundred comments, which for a local newspaper is like unheard of. Um, Joe and all it was was an apple. Joe Higgins, who was the editor at the time, was livid <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that this apple was getting more black. I think I was doing a court trial at the yeah. time and nothing. <laughs> right. Which is, the, I mean, it's just, it's kind of part of the escape, escapism that people mm -hmm. want is like, I don't want to read another court story. Right. Even though they are my heart and soul and I love court stories. <laughs> I That's what you think. People love the. I know. <laughs> I want to talk about what time Apple this is. Sometimes you just. So we want to look at cat videos. Photos. Yeah, <laughs> cat videos. The, the tumbles. The dog with no yes. legs. Tumbles, the innovation yeah. center. We um, just want to talk about that. We don't want to talk about politics last, anymore. Uh, I understand it. <laughs> last point I'll make, and then I'll promise I'll shut up. But it, it's. <laughs> uh, it, that, that's the that challenge. All. That's the challenge, right? Is is news? Say again, newspapers, but but media outlets in, in general having that that back and forth. And I think I would say in general, newspapers are lagging on that because a lot of reasons. But one, for so long, as we started the conversation with at the beginning of this video, of we're generally taught in journalism training and just as a thing is keep yourself out of it, right? Keep your own, mm -hmm. you know, we mean biases generally, but just, you know, as you a personal thing, it's not about you. It's about what you're writing about, right? So it's, it's going to be kind of hard to train newspaper reporters of all ages, really. I, I'm a younger one, and I still feel like awkward when I have to insert myself into something mm -hmm. to be on a chummy mm -hmm. thing with readers. Because so often that we're taught, hey, be the be the guy leaning against the back of the room at the meeting and shut up and listen. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So so that's that's the one thing. But you look at, I'll watch WSAZ to watch Jeopardy, and you can't go through a two-minute commercial break without, I'm not complaining, about two or three different ads that are WSAZ ads that are live at 10 tonight, make sure you watch the whatever, or, or hey, next Monday, the dangers of seatbelts are, are scoop tonight, right? And they, <coughs> new, TV outlets do a particularly good job at self-promotion mm -hmm. and previewing and teasing things. That's, that's the tonight at 10 type of thing. And new, newspapers were more focused on the work, were more focused on the, the reporting and, and wow. getting things out. And we hope that it's a slow grind of process of after story after story, daily newspaper after daily newspaper, we're going to build that trust. And by the end, hopefully, we've got you as a loyal reader and you'll want to comment and you'll want to do all those things. Um, that's the goal. I don't know that it, that it works every time, but that's the goal, I'd say. Yeah. I mean, and it's always the, the struggle that I always have is – wanting to do stories and, and wanting to connect with the community, but also not sounding inauthentic. And that's not to say that I don't have interest in the stories like the solar eclipse. I'm so excited about that. But you don't want to sound like, hey, I'm just trying to like somebody's trying to be cool, you know, sitting mm -hmm. on the back of a chair, trying to sound like I know what you want to hear yeah. and all the stuff you want to sound I'm giving you the information, but I also want you to enjoy what you're reading and enjoy that this is being produced. So that's a struggle. So, sometimes it's a solar eclipse. Sometimes it's a facilities discussion. Right, right. <laughs> and, the board of trustees meeting. And that's a, a, a good outlet, I think, would have a good mix between what you want to read and what you 
need to read. Mm -hmm. And that's the essence of everything in journalism is that balance between not being boring, but not being vapid. So mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's, that's the just of it from us. Not being boring, but not being vapid. <laughs> I don't think you're going to sell too many vapid bumper stickers, but I could be wrong. All right. Well, thank you all for taking time out of your busy uh, post-election uh, stupor, I guess. And uh, <laughs> thank you for your, for your work and joining us. And uh, to anyone who came and watched this, thank you so much. If you have more questions, I'm sure you could post them in the comments on the video. And I'm sure our speakers here would be delighted to respond mm -hmm. back to you. As they told us, they, they want you to talk to them. So. Yeah. Um, we'll give you our emails. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you her email. <laughs> <laughs>